Oui, euh, bonjour. Euh, je m'appelle Sébastien. Um, je apprends des français, but it's I think easier for everybody if I speak in English. So hi from my side. I'm very happy to be here. This is actually my very first time in Luxembourg, although uh, I'm German and it's not that far away. But I've never happened to be here before, and. I'm going to talk about uh, Java EE and why it is the <laughs> most lightweight um, enterprise technology. But um, first about myself. So actually, I think uh, slides are kind of boring, right? So I don't have really slides. The only slides uh, I have are about myself. So a little bit of uh, self-marketing. My name is Sebastian Dashner. I'm German. I'm based in Munich. And I'm a Java consultant, trainer, developer, whatever you want to call it. And I'm also a regular conference speaker so on conferences like this. I am quite involved in the Java ecosystem and the Java EE part uh, in the JCP. So I'm an expert group member on JAXRS and JSONP technology for Java EE 8. And I'm also a so-called uh, Java champion and uh, last one's um, Java 1 double rockstar speaker. And more marketing slides about myself. So. Um, about uh, topics like this in enterprise application development in Java. I'm offering consultant um, work and workshops and trainings. I go to uh, companies, no matter which, which area, but uh, as long as it's somehow Java and enterprise uh, stuff involved. And I'm, well, trying to, to spread some knowledge about uh, these things. But now about Java EE and why I think it's one of the most lightweight uh, technology. So who of you think, hands up, who thinks Java EE is somewhat heavyweight? Hands up. Oh, very good. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and you, you might have noticed I like uh, titles that ask for trouble, right? So why do you think actually it is somewhat heavyweight? Uh, what it is that it's heavyweight? Uh, just show the, shout it out. Give me some words like, is it EJBs or? Application servers, just shout it out. Who who thinks that's that's heavyweight? What what is it? Or questions? Who, uh, what do you think is heavyweight when when using Java EE? Sorry. Sandbox. Uh, sandbox. Sandbox. Oh, the JVM in general. Oh, okay. That's uh, that's an even more interesting topic about not only Java EE but Java in general. Um, yeah, so what I hear um, mostly is EJBs, our application servers, of course, they should just disappear. And, well, in the past, you will probably be right. But, okay, let's start. So what I will, uh, will do, I will live code uh, everything uh, for you. I like live coding and I hope uh, you too. And when there are some questions, just any time, feel free to interrupt me and, and ask, please. Uh, questions are highly welcome any time. And what I will do, I first uh, will show um, what I think is the lightweight part of, of the API and the programming model in general, and then we talk about more about the deployment model and uh, whether you should do war or jar and, and all these things. So um, I don't know about you, but I like coffee. So um, what I will do, I will uh, code a um, coffee example. And uh, since I found out that you in, in Luxembourg have a real duke, not only the Java mascot duke, but you know another duke, so we will do a duke's uh, cafe, right? And um, I will do a Maven uh, project. I will show you why in a second. And I will call this uh, duke's cafe, right? I, I hope no duke is insulted here if I, if I take this name here. And what I just did, that is actually a small shell script, which is something like a Maven archetype, so it creates um, uh, a basic Maven structure for us. Um, I could also do a Maven archetype, but this is actually faster, I think, because it doesn't download anything. And what is wrong with my, with my view here? This is probably a typical Linux problem. Oh, Jesus. Um, Okay, Duke's Cafe from XML, yes, it works as well. I hope this, yeah, now it seems, uh, seems correct. Okay, so who of you is familiar with Maven? 
main build says, oh, okay, I, I don't have to explain. Um, the only thing I'm using here in terms of dependencies are is this here, the Java E7 API, which is provided. And I built the whole stuff to a WAR file. So that means in my WAR file only my classes will be there once it's, uh, it's packaged. And it doesn't com uh, contain anything else, any third-party dependencies. And actually, that's about it for production code. We, will, uh, we can include some test dependencies, but nothing else per default should be there for real-world projects. So you don't need more. I will talk about the, the WAR file a little bit more later. And the only other thing I have right now, because I always need it in, in my kind of template, is the JaxRS configuration. That is um, more or less one of the few configuration things we actually need to bootstrap the JaxRS endpoints. So what we do, we will use, uh, use HTTP. And I think JaxRS is a really common, um, uh, common standard. And this is one of the few um, configurations. But that said, we don't need to change anything in this class, so we can close this, and we will never touch it again. And the also only thing that we need in terms of XML configuration, right? If you think J2EE or something, you had a lot of XML, you even have you know, Maven um, plugins uh, parsing that XML or generating XML and so on and so forth, no more true. This is the only thing we need. Actually, this file could even be empty. And this is only there because of this to um, allow CDI uh, be in discovery mode without any annotations. I will show that while, while coding. Same story here. We never touched that file, so you can forget about it. Web XML, forget about it. We don't need it anymore if, uh, if we use this uh, JAXRS only approach. So this is actually all the configuration we do. You, you, you notice the only class was this. So this uh, has been generated uh, for us. And now we can start right away with, with the actual code, what is interesting, right? Um, I will code a so-called coffee resource, which um, of course will be a JAXRS uh, resource. So we anno annotate this thing with path, coffees, right? So we will have some coffee management. So the Duke's Cafe, we can add a coffee, for example. And I think you're quite familiar with JAXRS, right? Hands up, JAXRS, oh, okay. That is used qu quite a lot. And so what I will show you um, are a couple of uh, typical things, and uh, especially the parts where, in my eyes, Java EE shines, is the integration with several specifications. So right now, I'm just doing the, the basic stuff. We have a JAXRS endpoint that probably calls a managed bean, either a CDI managed bean or an EJB, right? Um, what add inject is? You know, CDI injection, easy. We will have a bean called coffee shop where we can, for example, add some new coffees, right? And then I will, let's say I want to add some coffee. So let's say um, create a coffee from, of course, a coffee pojo. And this will be provided to our, to our managed bean there. A coffee, for here it will be a pojo. Let's say a coffee has um, a specific coffee type, right? A type of the drink. It has um, um, maybe some bean origin, right? If you think of a nice barista uh, coffee shop, you can choose where the beans should come from, from some tropical country, right? And well, let's, let's say that that's it for now, right? Type, let's say this is an enum with, you can order a cappuccino, right, or an espresso, and so on and so forth. And of course, so first ni a nice story about, uh, about Java E, and you probably, um, I'm pretty sure you know about that. JaxRS takes care of all the, um, of all the um, wrapping to XML or JSON, right? So all we have to do here is, for example, say produces the JAXRS part, um, media type application JSON. No, this is the wrong media type. Media type JSON. And the same is true for consumes. So it will tell us out of the box everything I post here will be, well, done with, with JSON, right? And then I can um, 
just do this to um, the managed bean, which could be a uh, CDI bean or an EJB. First thing uh, first, should we choose CDI or um, EJBs? Short answer, it actually doesn't matter for most of the use cases. So in, well, in terms of transactions, if you need transactions, then you can go with EJBs because they provide that out of the box. Otherwise, you have to add another um, transaction at transactional. But let's assume we just use at stateless and then we have an EJB. If you are afraid of EJBs, because what I always hear, they are heavyweight and somewhat, and the programming model is really, uh, is really horrible. Yes, that was true in the past, J2EE. It's no more true right now. Um, actually, I once had a conversation with, uh, uh, with a fellow Java E expert who said, once we introduced EJBs3, we should have renamed it. Just because of the thinking of the people, if they hear EJBs, oh, you know, same story works uh, and now the, the same way, but you know how people are, different name. Actually, there is um, a comparison that somebody has done in terms of performance comparison, because you know they are heavyweight and so what. So they compared um, spring managed beans versus CDI um, versus EJBs. And bigger value is better. You see that, well, on different setups, EJBs are faster than spring and CDI managed beans. Why is that the case? Well, long story um, short answer, because they are pooled. So a stateless bean um, can be pooled and, and reused and so on and so forth. So if you use, um, use them correctly, of course, without any state, because, well, they are stateless, they actually, that is not a question of performance. And don't also, short answer, I will talk about that later with application servers, don't optimize for this kind of performance. In short, don't think about it. This is not a problem anymore. So it's not true that these things are somewhat heavyweight. It's um, actually more interesting about the programming model. So if you think, should I choose CDI or EJB, the trend is, uh, goes uh, towards CDI and that the things are more interchangeable. Just go for, uh, for EJBs and you won't have a problem. The, uh, the much more um, interesting question is whether you do the programming model right. Right. In terms of concurrency, if you use singletons and bean managed concurrency or container managed concurrencies, and all these things are specified in the spec. So this is uh, much more interesting. So don't be afraid of EJBs. We just use EJBs here, and we will create some coffee and so on and so forth. So that is um, quite boring. I could, uh, I could deploy this, but it doesn't show really the lightweightness or the power of the API. Now. What I think is the most benefit uh, when using the API in Java E is that we have a lot of specifications. You saw just JAXRS, uh, that uh, is, well, it's actually another standard, JSR 3.30. Uh, we use CDI before, now we have EJBs. Uh, we have bean validation, we have a lot of things. And in Java EE, because of the umbrella specification, we can use all of this together just out of the box without needing to configure anything. Why is that the case? Because the Java E umbrella specifies if a container supports JAXRS plus supports bean validation, then the container has to ensure that these things work together nicely without anything else involved from the developer side. And that is the nice thing. If you use any, any other framework, then I mean, of course, you have to configure. You have to do some small um, extra overhead of configuration to, for example, activate bean validation for that uh, specific other um, HTTP endpoint, for example. So what we could do right here is, uh, if we want to use bean validation, we just add add valid, and for example, not null to not adding any any null uh, bean here, and then it will validate our our coffee. And what valid valid means? Well, uh, for example, let's say this is not null as well, so. Right, bean validation, right? Uh, who of you is familiar with, with bean validation specification? At least, yeah, that's also quite common. And so, of course, we could do some null checks. We could, could check for sizes and integers and all this. Also, bean validation spec, we could add our own validations, right? Because this is the part where it gets really interesting, because at the end of the day, we do some business logic, right? Something more than just a couple of types. For example, we say this is the bean origin, and 
um, let's say the bean should be in stock to, for them to be added. And this is something in a database that can be easily checked. And what we do here, this is of course a custom uh, constraint, a validation constraint. Um, beans in stock, so you know, bean validation spec, we add some um, special annotation here and we have a constraint um, validator, beans in stock validator class that we just create. And this um, is valid, this is the origin or beans origin. This comes from the um, bean validation spec. We don't need to in, uh, initialize anything here, and then we can check whether this is valid. This is, of course, cute, but what we want to do, we want to integrate that with our business logic, right? So, for example, we have a database check whether this um, bean origin stuff is actually valid or not, right? So, what we can do, we can use our technology. We can add, inject any managed bean that is known to our application. For example, the coffee shop. Coffee shop, and tell us, please, um, is in stock, something like that, right? And then this can do, well, whatever it needs to. Yes, please tell me, okay. And let's say um, return Colombia, beautiful country, whether Let's say for now, this is just uh, available there. Of course, in the Rewo project, you would do something like a database lookup and all kind of crazy business logic you want to do here. And this, and that is the nice story, can be integrated seamlessly. You just inject it, whatever you need. I want to have this um, business bean there. And John, just tell me whether this is in stock and valid or not. And then this will be used for validation. So that's it. Um, create, and this will then, if it's valid, print our coffee, yes. So this is something we can run already. What we do, we have a Maven project, Maven clean package. So package everything uh, into a WAR file. This runs really fast. Why it is the case? Because, well, our WAR file is almost empty. I will talk about deployment uh, stuff later on, but just uh, for now, it's 7K. Because provided API, right? Everything will be there on the application server that we need. And then we can run this in several ways. Um, I have, oh, Jesus. Oh, I had didn't uh, install Wi Fi yet on this machine. It's a new laptop. Let's take the Docker version. So, what that is, what I just started, it's actually a small Docker, um, it's a small, small uh, shell script that adds everything into a Docker container and runs it in a Wi Fi because I'm too lazy to download Wi Fi even. And, well, it's, it's already uh, started up. So also very fast, why? Because it's a small um, 7K WAR file. It doesn't have to do anything. And talk about application servers more. Application servers, modern Java E7 ones are fast, really fast. And yeah, that's done. And let's use any REST client of a choice. In my case, I like curl. And add localhost um, 8080 um, with Duke's Cafe. That's the uh, context, resources, and coffees, right? And then we'll tell us, of course, method not allowed because I'm only added post. So, of course, I have to post something here. Post with um, a specified application JSON as the content type, right? So let's add this, and then I will just... Um, I really have a bad memory. This is what you have to know. A type and bean origin type was, let's say, we want to have an espresso from Bean Origin Colombia. And then 204, no content. If Jack's arrest method is void, then no content per default. Of course, I could do all kind of uh, other stuff, um, Jack's arrest back. And the, um, oh, what is that? <laughs> that is very good. Oh, yeah, it uh, per default outputs a Wi-Fi or undertow outputs the exception. And here, it added the coffee. If I now want to have Ethiopia, also nice beans, it integrates with bean validation. The integration specifies if it's not valid, then per default, what that means, client error 400 bad request, HTTP. I could add um, a custom exception mapper also that then says, okay, now tell me some nice um, exception message as well. 
as an HTTP header, for example, or as a custom content. Um, but what I really uh, want to show you is integration here. You don't have to configure anything. Just it integrates, you say, at valid, and then whatever valid means in terms of field validation will be called and integrated with JAXRS. Uh, questions so far? Okay, what else can I show you? For example, um, events. CDI, and in my eyes, CDI is one of the well, most powerful um, specifications um, in Java EE. Has a nice thing called events, so you can actually decouple your code functionality via firing events. Right? Let's do this in the coffee resource here, just because we can. And we use this by at injecting a so-called event from JavaX, um, not, not the FX, but the CDI spec. And let's say we have a new coffee for new coffee events, new coffees. And every time Um, let's say we have something like a, a string representation. This is just uh, for the sake of the example, right? And a two-string method. This, of course, would have any custom business logic in terms of an event that you add here, but we just need, uh, need to have something there. New coffees, and then you say fire. New, new coffee by adding the coffee to string, for example. What I did, it fires an event, and then of any other uh, site, you have an event handler, for example, new coffee handler, if I could spell handler. And then on new coffee, you listen to that via observes, right? And you observe for that, and then, of course, you could output this. Th this has been around for quite a while. It's a nice way of decoupling uh, code functionality. What it is for now, and I really mean for now, it is a synchronous event. So that means this will, um, will block and wait until the event handler is actually has been called, and it also integrates with transactions if you're in a transactional context, which is very helpful because you can even specify, please add this while you're calling the code or at the end of a transaction or while you're committing, you know, so you have quite some options there. If you want to have this in an asynchronous way, so for example, if you do something like this, um, log support park nanus is like a thread dot sleep without the exception. So if you want to uh, leap for two billion milliseconds for two seconds, then this would block. And let's say this is a long running um, functionality we want to call here. Let's do this in an asynchronous way. What is out there is at asynchronous, but you see from the import this is part of EJB. So this is not part of the CDI spec and. Um, CDI events are handled by CDI, um, obviously. So what you have to do for now is that this has to be, um, for example, a singleton EJB. And that's it. And then it works, and it will work in an asynchronous way. Um, coffee arrived. I can actually show you. Stop this, please. Um, rebuild. And now you see the nice story about the deployment model, which I will show in a second that, well, it runs really fast. You rebuild it and um, you redeploy it in, in a Docker container. So what it does, it just rebuilt a new Docker container and did that for us. And if we now um, do this, you see, coffee was printed and also the client already returned. Two for no content and then two seconds later, this will be called. So this is done in an asynchronous way later on. This is a nice story if you want to have asynchronous CDI events today. It works, but not solely with CDI you have to have EJBs, which is not a problem. I mean, who cares? You have to add one annotation. I said for now, so what actually um, is the state right now with Java EE 8 that is about to arrive this summer, so really soon, in CDI we will have asynchronous observers and events already in CDI without any EJBs involved. So what you have then 
there is you have an observes async, uh, which of course right now is not there yet, and a fires async on the fire side um, respectively. And then you can do asynchronous CDI events even without EJBs. This is already final spec, uh, CDI 2.1, it's, well, uh, Java 8 is not out there yet, but this will be actually added. And then we can save one annotation and have the same, basically. Yes, v very good. But as you see, it's also uh, doable right now, if you're not afraid of EJBs. Um, what else um, do we need? Let's say configuration. And it's another more or less EJB example. What I really like in is the EJB spec um, in general. You can do a lot of things, especially when it comes to CDI producers. You can be really flexible. Um, who has heard of Delta Spike? The Delta Spike library slash framework. Yeah, a few. Actually, that's a really interesting, um, interesting technology. It's basically a CDI extension. You can add this as a library, and then you get a lot of stuff like uh, configuration predefined for you. But you can also, with very few code, do this yourself. And this is what I want to show you here. We can add inject all kind of managed beans that are either real beans defined in a class or defined in a CDI producer method. And what we want to uh, do here, for example, we want to have some configuration, right? Configured value, whatever that means. Add inject, of course, for string, that's, that's not that easy because, well, where does this come from? We don't know. So we have to have a so-called qualifier. And we could do all kind of named things, but let's create a much cooler own um, annotation, add config. So we, will have, uh, we want to have some config value th uh, values that can easily be injected. How to do this? I'm lazy, let's copy paste program. I copy paste this annotation, which is of course completely wrong. We will add a qualifier annotation. And this will be, let's call this value. This will be this config annotation, and let's say once we want to inject configuration, we just want to add this configuration somewhere in our code, and then CDI will configure it properly. And what configuration means, that's of course fully up to your project, how you want to configure that. But let's assume we want to inject something here that is a configured value that comes from a properties file or a database or whatever you want to have, right? And then um, we will add uh, non-binding. We will need this because of the producer, so the value actually doesn't uh, change where it comes from, because where it comes from is one class that, let's call this configurer, and this will be actually the um, CDI exposer method. String expose config, right? So this will be um, very important, take the right annotation, this will be a um, CDI producer here with um, a config qualifier and this will be empty because it's non-binding, it doesn't matter and everything will be called here. So that means wherever we add, um, inject an add config value, it will come from this method. And we have um, an invocation uh, context. No, this is interceptor, sorry, and I always get this wrong. It's um, injection point, sound very similar. And we can actually gather some information from our injection point. So this will be added and injected into CDI producers. And what that means, we can now ask for all kind of information about this point. So we can actually do some custom logic depending where we injected it. And the custom logic here should be take this value and read it as a key from a database or from a properties file, right? So what we actually do is give us the annotation config class, and this annotation will be used to take the value and use it as, as configuration, right? So what we could do right here is then, let's say we want to have a properties file. Properties. That are, of course, loaded from somewhere, so um, post construct in a properties. This will be called once this bean is, uh, is there. Let's say we want to add the properties and uh, load from an input stream. 
And the input stream comes from, of course, we load a file from the class path, right? Input stream. Um, input stream is configurer class, right? This is how you um, get resource as stream. And then we have an application properties file, right? This will be done in the class path. And that means, let's catch all the nice exceptions here. And of course, rethrow them again because exceptions here during initialization means that it wasn't uh, possible to load it. And let's load this into the properties and then use the properties to get um, the property from this point that we want to ask for, right? So we ask for, of course, this is only a um, simple logic. We could have some error handling here if it's not configured, but actually, we just ask that this configured um, value will be taken as a key to take the configuration. And now what we can do, that we ask to add to the class path an application properties file. And this will be then added for our configuration. Um, so I could add something to the class path here. Resources, um, application, properties, right? and take this configured value and let's say hello world or bonjour luxembourg la france oui and then this will be um, for example printed by application startup we can do all kind of stuff configuration configured value is this right this will be done after injection, so after all this. And that's um, basically it. We could use and add this to our class path. Then the um, configurer will load this and add this to our configuration. If I didn't forget anything, that should be it. Again, let's rebuild this. Then this property file is part of our um, war file, and because that's uh, interesting, let's look into that. Duke's Cafe War, it only includes, as I said before, I will talk about that in a second, it only includes the classes that we wrote plus this properties file. Let's start this up again, and then uh, this uh, will be added to our, um, to our application server and add some, some coffee here again, and then the configured value is this. That comes from, well, the properties file and this is just the integration that you have to write once. So this is actually all the code you have to uh, configure to have configuration um, custom tailored to your project. And then anywhere in your code, you can just add inject anything with add config. And then this automatically reads from your configuration. So this is, I would say, quite, uh, quite simple to use then and easy for developers, right? And you can even do more sophisticated stuff, more about that in a second. But first of all, I, g I could code, uh, code more on that level now, but just for you to get the impression what the real, in my eyes, power of the Java E API is, is that you can integrate all the specifications and all the power of, uh, of the technology out there within the uh, E umbrella together nicely without worrying about any kind of configuration without worrying, can I add inject something here? Just go for it. Mm. So uh, do you have any questions about, uh, about the API here? Yes. Um, you're logging now by using system out. Um, yes. In the real world application, people are using the logging framework. Yes. Um, is there something in WE that facilitates that? Um, not, I, I wouldn't say uh, not yet because I don't know if they actually want to add something. First of all, logging, this is probably a bad example because you shouldn't do logging. That's a, uh, that is an opinion of my own, so why you should log to a file, this doesn't make sense, who read these files? What you really want is to add metrics to your system, so who cares about, about logging, right? If I uh, write coffee equals something, nobody, will, nobody will, will read that. If you want to have some information about your system, like metrics, like monitoring, do something different. Add um, stuff like Prometheus and integrate that correctly by having metrics, by having real numbers, and not some uh, some random string that I write because I can, 
right? So in my eyes, you shouldn't do logging at all. Why? Right? And um, having that said, the system out print uh, will automatically go for, uh, for the logging here per default. So this is why I'm using it, just to have uh, something easier. Um, what else I would use is then Java Util logging. Of course, that's not nice at all, but also I say you shouldn't do logging. So what you can uh, do if you use some, uh, some framework like uh, Self4j together with Log4j or together with Logback or whatever is, uh, you want to have, then you could also use actually um, CDI producers. That's a nice uh, thing about in, uh, you have a producer for logger and then you can add inject the logger. This is actually nicer than having logger, logging factory, logger factory dot create logger or whatever, get logger, whatever that is called, all the time in your code. Um, this is another part about logging. But I would say try to avoid logging and think about what information do I have here and why do, uh, do I do this? Should I debug something? No, this is what tests and IDE debugging is for. This is actually much better than reading some, some weird strings. Should I debug when, should I output when a user is logged in or when I have some metrics together or something, information that could be interesting later? No, use proper metrics. Use business valued metrics that you want. If you have the number of transactions, if you have the number of um, user orders in your system, that's very interesting, of course, but expose that in another way. There are some things like Elk Stack around, which are very interesting technologies and uh, nice to integrate, but also that is some kind of uh, overhead, right? Because I write something to a um, log file, to a file, just to read it out later on and to do some custom parsing to get that information out again. Well, I could also think about the information that I want to have here and expose it as a metric in the first place. For example, using a Prometheus, uh, Prometheus um, format, for example, just having a counter of what you actually want, want to output there. Uh, but, the, but this is a totally other topic, so I would argue you don't need logging. Um, what you could do, you could add inject the custom, uh, custom logger. Having that said, this is actually a good part that I also want to cover third-party dependencies. For example, like a super custom logging framework, right? Short answer, don't use them. That's all you want to have in production code, fair enough. Of course, testing JUnit and all that stuff um, is nice and helpful. Why? Because I claim you don't need it. If you're having at least 99% of the uh, of a normal, enter normal enterprise um, application, then Java E7 at least offers all you need. You have a JSON integration by using JSONP. Java E8 will have JSONB as even nicer uh, binding with a declarative approach. Um, of course, you have databases, you have JAXRS at the client side, you can do all kind of HTTP stuff out of the box. And what else do you need, right? Because when I come to some project, um, what I see is they use well, Apache um, uh, collections you know, or Gurava collections that not, that's not needed with Java 8 anymore, right? You see Apache comments, very, um, uh, very common, right? <laughs> comments. And then I look for the usage and what they do, string utils um, is blank, right? And that's then something like the only usage. And therefore they add, I don't know how big that is, a megabyte of external dependencies. And then I'm like, okay, that's, that's cute, don't reinvent the wheel, right? But by providing one method your own, you can, rid of, you can get rid of all these dependencies. Use it when it's appropriate, but I claim don't do it in the first place. So what I also, um, uh, I talked about um, Delta Spike, right? So this uh, has some similar confi uh, some configuration like that, but also this is one class, right? You write it once, you never touch it, and then you're done. So you can, you know, argue about value and uh, what you add. Because the interesting thing is, and this is about the deployment model, once you add third-party dependencies, and you do so in the deployment artifact, you clutter up your WAR file or your JAR file with a lot of stuff. Megabytes of, of things mostly is the case. At least uh, I haven't seen um, external dependencies and resulting WAR files less than a megabyte. And what that means, every build, Maven build, you have to copy a lot of stuff which is not related to your project code, right? You change a class file and then you have to copy all these megabytes again. Same for a Docker build, same for anything that you deploy later on, no matter how your technology looks like. If you use Docker containers, 
Um, then I talk about Docker more in a second. Then the last layer will be bigger. All that has to be transferred. If you use Apache or Kiva or Nexus, all that has to be transferred over the network, and it adds up each and every time. I had the case when um, IntelliJ actually caches builds or something like that, and then the the um, the hard drive was almost running out of memory. Why? Because with all the hundreds of uh, builds I've done, they cached the jar file, or the war file, which in that case was 50 meg and more with the Spring framework. So each and every time, 50 megs, and you know, this is what you're doing, and this is what you're building each and every time. And this is what I say, the benefit of having that deployment approach by still, still having an application server that then deploys a thin WAR file with ideally no external dependencies and also not with the implementation being shipped because it's part of the application server, right? Talking more about uh, dependencies, when you actually should do so, it's when it's part of your business problem. So if you do some, actually my, um, my blog that I, that I have, it, it runs as a Java E application and it connects because I wrote it that way to a Git repository and uses ASCII doctor, you know, like Markdown, to compile this into HTML. This is part of the application, this is part of the, the business that uh, that application does. So then, of course, you include, in my case, it was JGit as a dependency and ASCII doctor. Because Git, if you implement it yourself, that's a lot of stuff to do, right? And then it makes sense because it's part of your business. But if you don't do string to util is blank checking as a service, then don't use Apache comments just because you have one, that one method. And this is not part of your business problem, right? This is just some clutter around it, and you can easily get rid of that. So if you use external dependencies, I claim, use something that you actually need for your business, and not just because it saves you a couple of lines of codes, but it clutters up the deployment each and every time. More about deployment. So what I've done here, and this shell script I used um, actually covers up a lot, is I use Docker um, with, well, my application server and that application, and I think Docker together with Java EE is the best uh, combination that you can have in the Java world. Why? Because the way how Docker containers work is that you have a um, copy on write file system approach, right? So every time you change something and you Docker file, copy, add, or run anything, that creates a new layer in your um, resulting container later on, so a new layer on in that file system. And that layer, it's like a git diff, right? It only contains the diff that you're adding. So what that means, if I have a container containing operating system, Java, application server, plus my application, if I change something, because everything is cached, I docker build only the last part that's different. That is my thin WAR file with 7K. I docker pull and docker push only that part that is different, that's 7K, and not the megabyte of data that is changing and it's actually not changing, but the, um, the fingerprint is changing e uh, each and every time I'm building, and I have to re-push that again, right? So if I have a fat jar or a fat war approach and pushing 50 uh, megabytes just because the, um, uh, the checksum changed of almost everything but, yeah, containing in my war file, then this is a lot of overhead, which is actually not benef uh, a benefit at all, right? Because you didn't change all this 99% of, uh, of the stuff you're deploying. And actually, it was the case a lot that I used my tethering because I had to at some conferences with uh, slow Wi-Fi, and I could do so because I'm only pushing four kilobytes of data to my Docker repository. And if everything else is, is there um, up front, but, but you pull the Wildfly image, uh, for example, once, and then that's it. So what I use here, this is also another helpful shell script that just creates that Docker file. Um, let's use the latest version here. What that is, this is a private image uh, of, my s uh, of myself using a private repository. It's basically a Wildfly um, application server that has Java installed and some stuff pre-configured. And why is that fast? Because, well, I'm only adding the WAR file. Each and everything, including the um, command to run the container, is there in the parent image and can be reused. 
So if I use that, and then I set uh, Docker build into Duke's Cafe, it's super fast because it's, well, adding, now it's 12 kilobyte of data, right? This is just my application, um, my application code. And um, now since the ti uh, time's almost up, I actually wanted to show, uh, show you more. You could also include this um, into, well, any orchestration framework that you like. Um, Docker Compose, or what I would prefer, Kubernetes, to run this and then to run your Java EE, you know, your heavyweight application in a modern um, cloud-native way. Um, a couple of sentences about, um, about cloud-native as well. Because a lot of times I hear, yeah, Java EE, it's not uh, suitable to, uh, for modern cloud-native um, environments and applications and so on and so forth. And I would claim this is not the case at all. Why? First of all, um, heavyweight application servers, this is not true anymore. Application servers, you saw it, um, they start up really fast. And so what you could even do and what I would uh, really advise you to is use one application per application server per container for one instance. Don't do several wars in one application service because then you get other problems once you want to monitor them. Um, then it's, it gets actually a mess and the overhead is neglectable if you're not Netflix or Google and running thousands of instances of your application. And that said, because it also runs, it starts up fast, right? Yeah, you saw that. And that said, you take this Docker container that I just built. So by the way, I could also run this um, right with some port. Um, 8080, and then you basically have the same that I did using my shell script. So it's the same story as before, right? It, it starts up, and then it's there, and then I could use it right away. So anyway, if you do this, you could um, use some um, orchestration framework like Kubernetes, and then you have things like a cloud-native app. Because once you think about these orchestration frameworks, and let's talk about 12 factors, because this is important, and it actually is, important. Then it says things like um, uh, config, store config in the environment. Yes, you can do so because, for example, the config I showed you in the properties file can be injected via Kubernetes using um, a config map and a volume. So you inject that into your application server and then you can actually add inject from your orchestration framework. If you need differences in your dev prod staging environment, right? Also, keep the, having that said though, you should keep them similarly as, uh, as similar as possible. Same is true for service discovery. They quite often say uh, Java EE doesn't um, have any service discovery approach technology. True, but I would argue in an um, orchestration framework, you don't need it because that's what the orchestration framework is for, right? We have the uh, DNS uh, resolvers, and actually I can access an HTTP resource. I don't have the time to show you, um, unfortunately. But if I want to do an HTTP call with JAXRS, included, by the way, I take um, logical name as a DNS, so I don't call any IP that is then different on all my environments, right? This is always the problem. So rather than I take a logical name, and let Kubernetes do the resolving using the services, right? I can have services and access them using the logical service name, um, and this decouples and minimizes the configuration in my project. Same is true for databases. In my um, application um, uh, server configuration, I can point to a logical database name and then letting the orchestration framework choose that for me. So this is what I claim the orchestration framework's job is. So this totally um, has not to be, uh, to be done in the application. And then you don't need all this, which also just clutters up your code. You could say, of course, I uh, can use um, Spring Service Discovery, uh, I forgot the name, um, which does that for me. Yes, but then it's also part of your code. And why should it be the case? I claim the orchestration framework, that's their, uh, that job there. Um, 
yeah, since the, the time is, is basically up, do you have any questions? About that. Actually, I can show you since I don't, uh, I don't have the time here. I, uh, I did a blog post about how to do the configuration with Wi-Fi in my case. So uh, you can see this. You can actually use Kubernetes with a, a config map and then just inject it. And I um, do a similar thing here. You have to add a module. And this is basically what you saw there to have the injection point. So you can add injector config that then comes from Kubernetes, not only from a properties file. Um, so you can use it in a cloud-native way. Yes? So the question is, um, what would be your main arguments for selling the, the uh, Java E uh, over the Spring and Spring Boot? Uh, um, a very good question. What is the main argument? So I would say big, big companies or the ones um, I'm involved with like the standard, actually, that it's stable if you choose um, Java E. So it won't change and disappear in, in two years or something because it will be backwards compatible. And this is actually a, a quite big issue. So we, we've had that in the past um, with, with a different framework. Then it just changes and something is not even deprecated. So just rather than just gone away and you use, you upgrade the version and then it doesn't work anymore, for example. Also, um, what is of course nice is, is the JCP in general, that you can actually take part in where, uh, where the involvement of the standards are going. And I claim um, the API, you saw it, is, is nice to use. And it's well known to um, a lot of developers anyway. So for example, JAXRS is, is widely used. I even saw um, Spring applications using JAXRS rather their own REST controllers, which at least speaks for the API, I would say. Um, and it integrates well without any configuration. And the technology in terms of everything that's supported, I claim is sufficient for at least 95% of the enterprise applications out there. What is shipped out of the box, right? With database access, with HTTP, with uh, CDI, with everything you, you saw there. Th this is um, my, my argument um, Yeah, for that. So, do you have any other questions? Then, uh, please do me a favor and uh, stop calling Java EE heavyweight. <laughs> and thank you very much, uh, merci beaucoup for your attention.